milestone here. This is the most detailed city I have ever worked on. We've passed Waterdeep. This is the biggest, most detailed, by block, by building, by shop, by person, by building city we've ever worked on. And the nice thing for that, about that is, no longer do you have to invent something on the fly if your characters do what characters always do. Oh, he wants us to go into that building with the beacon. And the, you know, the, the, the guy who's just carrying the giant golden idol in and the guards have buggered off. Oh, he wants us to go there. No, we're going to go over there. What's in yeah. this dusty shop? Does that happen all the time? Yeah. 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 We're going to yeah. mess with the GM. Yes. We're going to go down that alleyway and go through the third door on the left. Yeah. What's there? Yeah. And what's that NPC's name? Yeah. Most GMs are like, oh. So that, oh. that overview book answers all of that. Everything. What the deep dive adds is the backstory for every named character. In this book, there's at least one named character for every building. I don't include the city wells. They just get a line out telling you, hey, it's a well. Sort of like the ones you remember from fairy tales. It's got a little bucket and the thingy. The nobody lives there. But everything else has at least one NPC. And you get what they sound like, what they look like, what they are. And if they have some skill, like they're a smith or a potter, you get a percentage out of like 100 for it. they can they are like a god of smithing in whatever system yeah right so you yeah. can drop this into whatever game system you're working in and so we go from percentile system so if you're in role master you're in D, &D you're in creative norms you're in fate um, you can scale that you say this guy's 30 percent so whatever that system is at 30 percent that npc is at 30 percent if they're at 75%, you put them at 75% of whatever that world scales them. Um, so you can end up putting them into any kind of game system, game world you're in. Yeah. Uh, we're, not, we're not marrying them to the Fate of the Northern system, even though it's coming out in the Fate of the Northern system. What we want to do is, because of the advent of Kickstarter, and I've backed so many Kickstarters, I'm sure Ed's backed uh, equal, if not more, Kickstarter than that. Uh, most people now, they're plumbing all of this information for their home campaign so you know everyone's got their own system that they love they've got their homebrew world so they're either going to be taking mechanics from different kickstarters out there or they're going to take lore that, that's out there and adding it to the world so we're not you know in, in an ego trip that says okay this system and this or this world is the <laughs> end all be all of them we're giving you a toolkit that you can use for whatever you're running that you can end up taking little bits and pieces and say, okay, how can this be used in our ongoing weekly campaign? And that's kind of the whole goal of everything you're gonna get in that box set. So this is just the first piece of the box set. Mm -hmm. uh, within the box set, we're gonna have rules, we're gonna have layer rules, uh, we're gonna have pre-generated characters, we're gonna have uh, uh, economies, we're gonna have justice systems, all kinds of things that are built within the city that you can utilize for you know, everything in the box set, you can play out of box at your game table, or you can say, we already have an established game system or an established world, but we're gonna just, you know, cherry pick the pieces that we like. And say you're in the realms, and your player character is saying, okay, so we're riding into our bar. What do we see? And you go, hmm. And you flip through your entire realms collection and discover there's two paragraphs on there. Yeah. And there's one of those, Crappy maps, you know, that just merchant's quarter, slave's quarter, mm -hmm. ship quarter, and it's big gray blobs, and you go, great. You steal the city block, what is this? And wherever they go, now, the only, th the only thing you would have to change is, this is as authentic as we can make it, uh, because at the lowest magic level of the game, is in almost no magic, so, the, the highest level of magic is the city is alive with fae. There's a fairy queen living here. Magic is going big with me. Everybody's being manipulated, and they may or may not know it. And, you know, the gods are, you know, really working. Yeah, yeah. 
Um, so there's that level, but you can also play it straight. The gods are all myths. You know, they're just things. Priests want to wheedle some, some money out of Yeah, so they tell you this, so they tell you that. But you've never seen a spell go off and work and all that stuff. You can play it at that level. So if you do it at that level, it is as historical as we can make it, which means both the Norse, who conquered the city and are flooding into it, and the Hibernians, the Celts, the future Irish, who were conquered, many of them still live in the city and they live in all the countryside around. At this point in history, nobody has surnames, they have by names. Um, Osric the Foul Farter. Um, as a ship front, which is a very polite Norse way of saying big boobs, ship front. Um, or if their by name wasn't a physical characteristic or something they'd done, like Dragon Slayer, um, if they were completely aggressive and belligerent and big, large, coarse people, they might be called half trollsome which didn't mean that they were descended from a troll. It meant they were large, coarse, Spade. whatever, like trolls. Um, but everybody else, it was son of or daughter of. Which is where we get the modern surnames Magnuson and Samuelson from. It's son of Magnus. Um, but in those, at this time, they are not surnames. They got frozen much later in our, like, 1800s. So let's, let's set the setting, right? Yeah. So it, it, we're about 930 AD. Yeah. So yeah. The, the setting is um, 930 AD Ireland. Mm -hmm. Athcliath is the name of Dublin at the time. And the reason we chose Dublin um, out of the Fate of the Norns universe is because we really, there were, there were a lot of cities. So in the Fate of the Norns universe, we've got the Scandinavia, we've got uh, Denmark, with the Balts, Baltic states, We've got so many places out, Gorgeous out west. Oh yeah, it's true. Gorgeous map. So we've got a massive, massive array of choices in terms of which city we're going to end up choosing for this project. You know? So Ed and I are like talking, we're like, okay, there are a ton of cities. There's Alvaldsnes, there's Skeppermo, there's, there's so many amazing trade posts within Midgard in the 10th century. Um, but we settled on Dublin because it's, it's a very interesting melting pot at this point in time because you have the Gales that have been invaded by the Vikings and they have just been invaded maybe a decade ago. And they've also had Christianity that has taken hold maybe a century before that with monasteries and things like that. So you've got this melting pot of religions and cultures of pagan Vikings, pagan Celts, Christian Gales, all in one city. And then you have different pantheons of gods that are competing for the city. So you have the Tuatha Dé Danann, you have the Firbolg, you have the Fomorians, you have the Azer gods, the Vanir gods, you have the Christian, what we call the white god, the Kriostai, um, all vying for power and leverage within the city. Um, and that, that was the fascinating point, is all these levers of power that allow the players and the GM to make the city their own, right? So mm. it, it has so many possibilities of where it can go. And so when we play with history, what we want is something that's historic, but we want the players to make it their own. So you can go wherever you want with history. And we already went somewhere with it because Citric by 930 should have been booted out of mm -hmm. Ireland, but we're like, no, 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 he's still there at 930. Yeah. By that time, he came to Northumbria. Exactly, yeah. He got booted out to Northumbria. We said, no, 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 there's, there's some more interesting stories to tell here. Um, and so we were encouraging this by twisting history a little bit to show how players can say, we can take history and have a little bit of a twist to it to have your campaign rewrite history into whatever you want it to be. Um, and the little slider that Ed was talking about in terms of low magic and high magic, that's something that we've been working on at Pendlehaven for a very long time with everything from um, difficulty level in your RPG. So we have damage tracks when it comes to difficulty level of the RPG. So when we release our runic game system, you can determine how difficult you want your system to be. So uh, most RPGs, it's like you've got one crunch, or not crunch level, 
uh, lethality level, right? Like how lethal. Call of Cthulhu is very lethal. 5e is not lethal with death saves and things like that, right? But in Fate of the Ragnarok, you have a slider on how lethal you want your system to be. And we don't tell you how lethal it's going to be. You decide how lethal you want your system to be. Uh, same thing with the crunch mechanics within the system. We give you three levels of crunch. And everyone at the table can play at the level of crunch that they want. And the system ties it together. And everyone can play at a different level. Because when you play at an RPG table, there's people that love fate, which is like a more... Uh, narrative-based system where you're like, I want to tell a story, I want to go on an adventure, let's let's kick the rules into the back seat and just go on an adventure, where there's other players that are like, I want to play Shadowrun, I want to play Rollmaster, I want to see numbers stacking, I want to see numbers popping off, and everyone in between, right? And so we give you a slider as well. You can set the level of crunch you want in your system. And it's the same thing in this city, is we want to give you a slider for the, the level of magic and fantasy and mythology that if you want a low fantasy or high fantasy, we're going to give you that slider as well. So that's kind of our, our MO, our DNA, in terms of how we design things. Is we don't tell you how to play, we give you the toolkit that every single one of your game tables can play at the level you enjoy the way you want to play. Yeah, and for, for this city, we tell you, okay, the food comes from here, the food goes here. And this is how you get rid of it in the city. The night wagons. Yes, the night sort of wagons. You can take that and put it in any other fantasy settlement. Um, I imagine if it was a village, you wouldn't have to worry too much about that if it was a rural village because people would literally fork the manure out back and then they plow it in. And they'd be used to their own manure and their own parasites, so it wouldn't give them walloping dysentery to buy their own, uh, eat their own stuff that they, they grew in that. Travelers? There's, there's a reason why it's called Montezuma's Revenge. But I mean, uh, but all of that can be transplanted. And we have things like, um, we work out uh, many of the inns, taverns, and eateries in this city. We have give you menus, price lists. And, and lore behind the menus. And, yeah, the, yeah. And, and there are, okay, I didn't go whole hog because we don't have the space for it because we're running out of word count. I think that thing is 360 other pages. Um, to do the old, old forgotten wrongs, I'm going to provide you all with detailed recipes. But there are some very simple Well, we have a Patreon recipes. that yes. we'll, we'll go down the rabbit hole. Yeah, yeah. The... yeah. <laughs> but you will understand why this is needed, why this spice is popular and expensive. Yeah. And you, you can chart your own, because the warehouses are all worked out and everything, and who rents from whom, and you can decide, okay, there's a run on salt, or whatever, or somebody is, ships have come from the, the hot south with new supplies of salt. How does that affect the price in the city? Is somebody gonna hoard it and try and maintain the price high and sit on the salt for a bit, or start shipping it all over Hibernia, rather than let the city get a price break because it's now, you know, you, the, the stuff is there. You can do all that stuff in your campaign. You don't, it, like the realms for years, you don't have to use that level of detail if you don't want to, but it's in there for doing it. For instance, Andrew has built into Fate of the Norns all this detailed stuff in combat, special powers, the colors of the runes you draw matter, but if your grandpa or grandma wants to sit down and say, so what's this weird, funny, satanic game you play. You could sit down and run this, Fate of the Nords, and just say, oh, you've got a bag. The bag's got runes in it. And if Grandma objects to that on religious grounds, oh, they're all religious symbols. Because they are. And then you say, just draw a rune. And you can tell Grandma every verb of what you want to do in your turn is a rune. If you want to jump up from your t jump, that's a room. Run across the room. Run is a room. And dive out the window without opening it first. Dive, that's a room. That's three rooms. That's the simplest way to play the game. You don't have to, you know, I go into all this stuff that we as gamers love. You know, is someone bloodied? What's the reach and range of that weapon? You don't need to do any of that for Grandma. You do, and, it, and then when she settles down into, oh, we're just telling a story. Yeah, we're just telling a story. 
yeah, you know, that's the systems of crunch. Yeah. yeah. So the lowest level of crunch, you can teach the grand mind in under five minutes. Yeah. Like we just taught a whole table mm -hmm. of well, six out of the eight players were new, right? Yeah. In under five minutes, they were playing yeah. the game just like yeah. three hours ago. And the nice thing is, they can play at the same table in the same game as grandma, yeah. at a at a deeper crunch level. If the Norn, unlike me, but like Andrew, knows what they're doing. They can be doing it with the colored runes and, and the, the playing and the conditions and the special powers. And Grandma may feel if, it, if there's lots of discussion that she's missing out on something. And then <laughs> <laughs> yeah. there is that a nice little gradation that you can go down the rabbit hole as yeah. far as you want to go. So as I, as I teach the rules in the, the five minute demo of like, let me walk you through the pre-gens. Let me show you how the runes work. You can tune out whenever you want. Like the lowest mm -hmm. level of crunch, everyone's tuned in. And as I go down the thing, and I talk about meta tags, about combining runes into a rune chain, some people's eyes glaze over. I'm like, that's fine. That's a lower yeah. crunch level yeah. or a high crunch level. You don't need to play that level. Like you can play the game at a lower crunch level. And that's, that's the whole aspect of, you know, our, our design system here in this game. This first book is the overview. So if you do not want to go into the nuts and bolts of the city, this is the overview book. And then as Ed was saying, what's coming next are the deep dive books. So we're gonna get into you know the characteristics of each one of the NPCs that are living in these cities. And one of the things that we wanted to do with our rune game system as we're heading towards urban campaigns is we don't want murder, hobo, like, you know, oh, if I want to use my character sheet and use the powers on my character sheet, I have to go into combat. I have to kill someone. I have to use, you know, these whirlwind attacks and backstabs and things like that. So we introduced a whole system of social combat, crunchy social combat. So you can see your character sheet and you're like, oh, not everything is a nail that I have to hit with a hammer. But a lot of the powers are social combat powers where I can question people provoke them to emotional conditions, I can compel them to do things, I can convince them of things, and these are special abilities that you get that sense of satisfaction that I'm using abilities on my power, I'm drawing runes, I'm akin to rolling dice, mm -hmm. I'm using abilities, and I'm getting that satisfaction without having to kill someone in town. Yeah, so right? the, the teachers who do not want to preside over a classroom of students gleefully talking about how they eviscerate somebody and flick out their eyeballs with a dagger and to the cheering crowd um, <laughs> can instead role play all those juicy henry the eighth intrigue things where cardinal woolsey is whispering in people's ear you can do that with social combat and to do that in the deep dive book which doesn't exist in physical form yet because i'm coming five blocks away from finishing it because I had to come here first. Um, uh, um, there are 96 city blocks in this book. Every building is detailed. Every building that has an inhabitant, which is almost all of them, again, except the That's wells. That's what, 1,200 yeah. locations. Yeah, so they all Fully have an detailed. NPC. Okay, but in the deep dive book, each NPC has a dirty secret so that you can do so social combat. If you know their, their proclivities. Yeah, their proclivities and their characteristics. And dirty secrets. Three yeah, things. Three things. Plus a physical description. Yeah. And and if they have any pet catchphrases that drive everybody around them nuts. Or um, <laughs> personal habits like picking their nose constantly like this till it's bleeding or whatever, that's called out too. So you can easily role play them. Also, what their building looks like is called out in this. If it has anything distinctive like a round blue door and everything, we mention it. So the dungeon master, the Norn, in Fate of the Norns, does not have to stop and make something up. We did the work. It's the, it's the good old thing. If, if we expect you to pay for a gaming product, we will do the donkey work. So your work can be having fun with your friends at the table, storytelling, not, oh, crap, now I have to make up what all the roofs in the city are made from. No, we tell you for every single building, what the roof is made of and what condition it's in, in case you want to jump on it, Even run across it, <laughs> chase people. Artist was freaked out. He was like, wait, I'm, I'm getting like roof information when I'm making this map? <laughs> yes, there is roof information here. Yes. Every single one of these roofs yeah. was outlined in terms of the material that was made of. I am nothing if not <laughs> anal retentive. No. <laughs>
<laughs> it was that level of detail. Yes. So yeah, if you join the Patreon, like we will continue. This is like at the very back of this book. Uh, if you guys are curious to join, uh, we have committed to continuing the city beyond the last Kickstarter. So we have Patreon that we will continue the North Shore of the Liffey, the tent city, the palace, the underground sections of the city, even though in most places, like you think like medieval uh, cities, the, the trope is the sewers, the dungeons, right? The, the issue with Athliath or Dublin is you're right on the Liffey, everything is the water table. So you start digging down to your basement, you got water. Yeah. So you don't have that, it kind of messes with players where they're like, oh, we're going down to the dungeons of the city. Uh, yeah, you're not going very deep because it's 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 wet. <laughs> you know, and so there are certain places that are very special, and exactly. Yeah. So yeah, you know, so yeah, yeah. it's it's there. There are going to be some very special places called out because of the fae, because of the geology, because of the people that are there, uh, because of the other realms intersecting here, because of Yggdrasil. Uh, so. Those, those are the little surprises that we, we've got in store for you there. Yeah, so let me just do quick geography. On this big, gorgeous map, the sea's that way. This is the River Liffey. It's a tidal river over there. Yeah, yeah. The Liffey is a tidal river. You can see some of the longest longships, or NAR, here, drawn on the map just for scale. Okay, right here, is a bridge building attempt where they are trying to bridge the Liffey to reach the North Shore where the monasteries are. There are there are two ancient Celtic highways or Chli as they were known and one of them already exists so there's been a ferry here for centuries. They're trying to make it a physical thing although there's a marsh on the north side so that the king can expand the city in that way and tax more people and because certain, I'll, I'll, I'll draw the veil of secrecy over this, um, a yeah. certain elements wish the white god to go away and all of the white god's followers to suffer horrible pain in the verses. And one of them, of course, is the king because he's a devout, that's why he's the one-eyed king. He, he made a blot to Odin when he was a teenager. He plucked out one eye and threw it in a brazier and burned it as a, as a block, as a sacrifice to Odin, because Odin has only one eye. So he's a devout um, worshiper of Odin. Um, he doesn't like the white god, the Christian god. So the monasteries, which are on, safely on the North Shore, may not be safely forever. But, it, but in the meantime, it seems that some magical bedevilments, to use a Christian term, um, keep befalling the construction workers, yeah, yeah, over and over again. And um, I don't want to lead you astray by using the, the word bedevilments into thinking it's necessarily Christian. I think it's more necessarily faith of some sort or other. Why? That's another thing. Okay, this the is- contractors the, are frustrated in no way. Yes. <laughs> yeah, and, and there's, by the way, I've been tweeting on Twitter endless news rumors. and rumors of Athcleath, and eventually we'll do a book of them called Meanwhile in Athcleath, because that's how I begin it. Meanwhile in Athcleath, and it's just the local news, and you, you get to hear about this every few days as the latest <laughs> the calamity happens. Yeah, But um, we are on an area where the river Poddle comes from the projector there up, and it hits a stony ridge and it turns to go around the stony ridge slows down and Athkleas, the black pool which is a swamp is right there and then it flows out from the black pool into the Liffey the reason why the Vikings settled this because when they were just raiding Viking raids they needed a place to beach their longships that the tidal river wouldn't just take all the ships out to sea and leave them stranded in a enemy country that they just pillaged. Or, yeah, yeah, yeah. And the swamp is a backwater, the Black Pool. So that's why they chose this. This is also a bit of a ridge. So you could, some 
poor young schmuck um, of that could be posted as a sentinel while the rest of you got blind drunk and actually got some sleep. But this poor guy had to stay awake because he could see a little further in all directions. Uh, if there were enemy ships coming, yep. if um, angry Celts were arriving to, to send you to your gods. Um, and, and he could rouse, which is why they chose that. But this is all historical. This all still exists. The palace still exists, although not in that form. But, yeah, the, yeah, the Blackpool is gone. It, yep. is, it is a park. If you go to Dublin today, you can see it, you, or a tiny shrunken remnant of it, because mm. this is now valuable downtown real estate, and it's sort of like picking the center of a large American city. Yep. If you are familiar with it, Indy from going to Gen Cons, there's yeah, a little, right. you know, well, there's a little tiny bit of the monument circle. You know, that tiny little thing of greenery with the cars roaring around it. That's sort of what's left of the Blackpool today. But, yeah, we are going to go on making this. We're going to, I, I, I can't use the phrase because it's still a trademark, living city. Yeah. But we are going to make this city. In city. Yeah, this city is going to be alive because we're going to keep doing stuff. Um, at this convention, we're running... We've just run the first one. Three mini adventures, all set in the city. They are the Patreon offerings of this month. Yeah, there will be more of them. But you get the adventures, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So we give you city blocks. We give you adventures. We give you NPCs. We give you all kinds of things during the Patreon, and we're going to be growing this, evolving this city over years to come. So. Um, this is something that's not static. It's mm -hmm. not a publish and forget. Uh, and the amount of time that we've spent, I mean, the last two and a half years, the amount of conversations we've had about like night soil wagons and laws and like, you know, fees and wait, the players are gonna shape shift and fly over the walls. How do we keep them from like starting a black market of illicit goods? Uh, you know, without taxation of getting past the guards, like the amount of conversations we have had in the last two and a half years of making sure that the city is sound and everything makes sense is is, mm -hmm. is crazy. There's a there's a uh, a lady craftsman here, and she's a very specific sort of smith. She makes hatchet heads, and she has a percentage of skill of giving you a really good hatchet head. But because she makes hatchet heads. She's really good at catching hatchets when you throw them at her, but she's not as good as she is at making the heads. So she has like an 85%, we were talking about earlier, for making a really nice head, but for catching a, a hatchet out of midair, if you throw it at her and she sees it at the last minute, just goes, pulls it out of the air, she might be a 65. So she gets two ratings, you know, yeah. Yeah, but things like that that might arise. We've thought about them. We've talked about them, and we put them into the book. Crazy <laughs> conversations, yeah. yeah. And, and Tent City, uh, that's, that's a whole other city that's outside the walls. So the thing with Citric is he has a lot of ambitions. King Citric has ambitions that are from the mortal realm, because King Ethelston in the Great Isles is raising a massive army to deal with the Vikings. Um, there is an undead queen in Tara, uh, Queen Neve, who is Straight raising an army against uh, him as well. Uh, he's dealing with, uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't want to throw spoilers because I know we're, we're streaming here. There's certain spoilers that I don't want to throw yeah. out there, but there are so many things that he is dealing with right now that uh, he has 100% taxation on the city. So every single price is doubled because of his taxation, because he has such ambitious plots and schemes for what's going on within the city walls and what he needs to do. So if and all of so, you who are bitching about paying taxes <laughs> at this time of year, yeah. it's not an income tax, it's a sales tax that doubles the price of everything you buy. So you, you walk into Walmart yeah. and it's like a, a $10 tankard. It's 20 bucks. It's 20 bucks now because 10 bucks <coughs> is going straight to the king. And so what we've got outside the walls is Ten City. And that is a city that is almost the size of Athliath, which is something that we're going to be tackling afterwards, which is a bunch of people that have come to the sanctuary of Athliath because it is Ragnarok. And this is the place of prosperity, riches, food, uh, security, and, but they can't afford the tax. So they have set up tents to live outside the city. 
and that's what Ed was pointing at, outside the city. And this is something that we're going to be building out as a something that's very dynamic and very fluid, but has a very tight relationship with the city. Um, and there's a lot going on in Tent City, which again, I don't want to throw the spoilers out there, but that is an entire other like 12 months of project of just that Tent City, which is a synergistic aspect of Athcliath. Um, then there's the North Shore that we talked about, and then there are the other realms. Uh, there's the Dvergar, the Knockers, that are dealing with um, realm wars that are coming from other worlds uh, where they're crafting things that are supernatural in nature, uh, that are more than you know iron, steel, things like that. They're taking ores from Muspelheim, Jotunheim, uh, Nidavellir, Svartalfheim, Alfheim. Um, so there are these supernatural elements. And again, this is the slider that you can play with. You can say, we don't want any of that. Or you can say, we throttle this all the way up. And you've got this black market of <coughs> materials that are coming in from other worlds that the dwarves are creating these incredible things. Because there's so much money that is moving in the city that this can be afforded in this city. Nowhere else in Midgard can this happen except in Athelia. So this is the city of wonders, um, and that's where the potential is. And so all of these things are are here, and we're, we're kind of hinting them here, and then they're going to be built upon in, in the future uh, expansion books. And there are prices for just about everything in there that is critical to what it is. If it's a tavern, how much the ale is going to cost, and what the selection is, and the food, and so on. Um, there are a few basic prices that are in the Fame of the Norns Ragnarok rule book, you know, for buying a mule, buying a cart, buying a ship. Um, but everything else, I made sure we put in the rule book. And then we talked about what was missing, because Andrew would read everything I wrote and said, okay, but what about, okay. what about, you know, because it, uh, we'd rather do it us as gamers before you guys, guys get the book in your hands and say, well, what about, they forgot, you know, it was like, you know, we can't fit everything in, which, look how thick that book is, is, and how the price point goes up and up and up as you make it bigger, and you have to decide what to leave out. But we have thought about it already. It may not be in everything, but we thunk it through so that you don't have to, so that when you can ask us questions, like here and now, if you have any questions. Yeah, we will have a Q&A yeah. at the end of this, so you yeah. guys can ask questions. Yeah. We will jump in and have an answer for most things. But yeah, we're just having... It, this is pure world building fun for me and it is oh, we have years more <laughs> yeah that was one of the things you were saying the TSR and Watsi and stuff were tie binding your hands that you can only go so deep with water deep and things yeah. like that and I said Ed go wild like the, we're, we want the city of like I've always urban adventures have always been a trouble for me to run because I've had these shitty players that are like, yeah, we're going to mess with you, Andrew. We're going to go down that alleyway and turn around. <laughs> you're fucking some, yeah, he's a shitty player. Nigga. <laughs> <laughs> then they're going to be like, yeah, we're going to ask the guards all their names. What are they, all their names? Oh, crap. What are all their names? Okay. And then we want to know where they go drinking after they, they, they clock out at 5 p.m. And, you know, all of that stuff. So urban adventures are always a challenge for GMs, right? When you run a dungeon crawl, it's very constrained. If it's like, you know, any kind of other adventure, it's very constrained. But when you hit an urban adventure, it's always a challenge. Even if you're an experienced GM, there's just so many variables to hit. And that's why Ed and I were like, we're going to do the heavy lifting for you. So you can handle the fun of the game. And then when the players are being asses and go, you know, like, ah, where do they go drinking after? We've got the answer for you. Just yeah. look to it and yeah. you got the answer there for And there's, there's a rooming house in one of those yeah. blocks where it isn't just the landlord. It's 18 people who live in the rooming house. Here's yeah. all their names. Yep. Here's what they do. Here's what they look like. Here's what the rooming so house good. smells of, mainly cabbage. Yeah. <laughs> or, or mainly fish. Just a quick survey. Is. How many of you guys are DMs or GMs here? Holy crap. Most of you. Okay. okay. So even if you don't want to do Fate of the Norns, and even if you don't want to do a, a historic real world city, buy that and plunder it. Yeah. Use it for your own, like if you're in Waterdeep or whatever, or 
if you're making up your own city, just grab a city block out of the middle of that, and whichever city block they go into, <laughs> it's magically that one, and, and and use our Scott word, so you don't have to. Yep. You can spend your attention on the story, on the unfolding. And the other thing is, once you write things at that level, and you just leaf through the book when you're on your own, it spurs hundreds of stories because there's little details here, and they go, "Oh, I could, you know, you know like I'm I'm wearing an Oscleas shirt that Andrew gave me when I arrived, and look at those three beautiful ravens." Ah, oh. These ravens for the significance. Yes. yes. So the significance of the three ravens and the three towers. So um, there are three Viking kings that went across from Norway to the British Isles, and so you had um, a Citric, you had um, you had Citric, Rogenwald, and um, oh man, why am I drawing a blank? Of course, I'm drawing a blank. Yeah. The third guy, the third brother, <laughs> and who goes to Alt Clute, right? Yeah, Alt Clute, exactly. Yeah. Why do I draw a blank on a panel? Okay. Always. So always. there's Alt Clute. Okay, so there's Jorvik, Alt Clute, and Athkliath. So yeah. these are the three Viking cousins that basically create this like Viking strip of kingdoms um, in these three seats of power: Jorvik, Alt Clute, and Athkliath. And those are the three ravens with the three towers. No. So that is basically they will help symbol. each other against King Athelstan, but and we've already covered this in the Patreon. They all have spies in each other's cities, yeah. and they none of them want one of the others to get a real leg up on them. So they're also trying to thwart whatever you're doing, and they know that Citric is up to something. Where is all this money going? You know, he's taxing a hundred percent. He's not spending it 100%. He's not eating off of gold dishes and, and pooing into golden toilet bowls. But the money's going somewhere. I mean, he isn't, because they, their spies have checked, the palace is not full of rooms of solid gold piled up to the ceiling. The, the money is being put to use somewhere, somehow. Doing what? And he, they, the, the spies will try and keep track of who he has dealings with in an attempt to find out what. Because for one thing, if he's dealing with arms dealers and he's just put in an order for 46,000 spears, he's not doing that to use them as garden stakes. Because nothing's growing, no sun. Yeah. yeah, so he's preparing for something. What? You know, <laughs> because it, it's going to be military. So all of this is going on, and everybody in the city knows about the king's secret agents, because they are not secret. They are like the Gestapo or the Stasi or whatever. Everybody knows the king has these dirty James Bond types called the Shadow Hands. Yeah, yeah. Not my favorite. And you you will get to see some of them if you read my novel, The One Eyed That's King. Not, yes. yes, there are Shadow Hands all over the place doing dastardly things, and. In that novel, they make some, they are pushed into making some overt attacks on certain people. Right at the beginning of the novel, there's a strong suspicion, and you will know when you read it who's pushing them. And then later on, you will watch Start it. Start with what, how it begins. What is the first line? I am come to kill the king. So we look over the shoulders of two teenagers who are both. Irish, both Hibernians. They have both been sent by their clans, two separate clans, to come to the city and find out what Citric the King is up to and terminate him if they deem it necessary. And whatever they do, report back before they try and terminate him in case they get off. And why are they sending two teenagers? Because they're complete fodder expendable and because it's complete plausible deniability if they get caught and tortured and the secrets come out of them the clan elders can say to the king you really believe we'd send like a teenager to, you know come on you know we may be vile 
we may be evil, we may hate your guts, and we may be dirty Celts, but we're not stupid. You know, <laughs> so that's why they said, and the, the two, one male, one female, they come on the same ship, and they don't know about each other's missions, so they get very suspicious of each other. And they land, and are, they've rented cheap rooms, or they start to rent cheap rooms because the carter who meets the ship, who's basically like a, a talkative New York taxi driver, wants to take them to the place he'll get a cut. Mm -hmm. And he takes one look at them and goes, oh, teenagers with no money. Okay, I'll take them to the cheap place. You know, <laughs> and, and that's how we get into the novel. And very soon after that, you see something dastardly happening involving fire, and you're seeing the shadow hands at work. And that's how you get sort of eased into life in the city. But the whole point of the novel is I don't have heroes in shining white and dastardly dark lords leading villains who walk around in black and have breathe. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm not doing that. Everybody gets to be witty to each other. Shopkeepers, people in the street get to go <laughs> to each other um, throughout the working day. And that's the fun of it. I'm bringing the city to life and giving you hundreds of stock characters and how they talk and the gossip going on in that path and the expressions until you want to. You can spend your time on saying, oh, so you just plundered her wardrobe. Okay. Uh, 16 skirts, this one's silk, this one's, you know, y if you want to go to that level of detail, and I haven't provided it in that book or in the deep dive. But the novel goes into yeah. a level of detail yeah. that has an amazing cast of mm. Celtic nobles, Gaelic nobles, that are, uh, I guess, in ally, allied together mm -hmm. against the king, mm -hmm. but there is a twist to all of that. A, a very interesting plot twist, mm -hmm. and that that just makes the city really interesting because it is not a black and white city. It is very gray, yeah. very gray. And we can tell you one thing straight up at the beginning about the, this unholy alliance of Hibernian nobles. Uh, one of them used to be the king's lover, and therefore thinks she knows the king through and through, mm -hmm. and is trading on that because she has to. She's been pushed. Yeah, backs to the wall, and and you get, you get to see them meeting each other, and you also get to see them defying the king. I, I just tweeted one of the things where you know yeah the king sent another messenger to summon me to the palace right away, but an accident happened, <laughs> and you know Citrus going to get suspicious if things keep happening to his messengers, and mm hmm I hope so. After all, eight of them have had accidents so far, and soon the king will have to do the zone message. Yeah, he'll have to deliver his messages himself. Mm. You know, <laughs> <laughs> so it's that sort of thing, and you get the feel for the city, the mood of the city, and when I do the meanwhile and ask by ask tweets, which you know anybody can read, and they're free. You know, you don't have to pay for that, and you can, by the way, you can rape and plunder those for your own fantasy cities. That again have nothing to do with that class. Just bore them, take them, and file off the serial numbers, and they're in your city. Um, but you get the feeling of the changing mood of the city and what's going on, what people are talking about. Um, we didn't have time to to cover them because we were too busy covering cabals. We were here first. The cabals. Yeah, but because I covered the cabals, I couldn't cover the sports teams. You do have one game in there which is a historic real-world game they still play called Erling. They play it slightly differently now um, because um, using the heads of your enemies and delivering them back to the losing side is probably not considered au uh, fait with modern laws. But, but, I mean, but yeah, Hurling is in there. But I didn't cover the sports teams. I did cover the fact that they wager on everything, but not the process. Although that keeps coming up again because that... I figure it's better if you guys role play. The wagering you should be role playing at the table, because if you're not interested in doing it, you just say, "Oh yeah, they're they're dickering." But if you want to role play through, I haven't handcuffed you by saying, "Oh, they'll do this and they'll do this," and 
they will chalk it on a board behind the bar. Or no, I'm leaving that up to you. <coughs> How they do it in most places. In certain establishments, there are agreed upon things. And I have covered them because hey, you're paying for this. Yeah, the stuff should be in there. And one of the things that I've covered is layers. So when you end up coming into a city adventure, definitely what your players want to do is set up a base of operations. So what we ended up doing is creating a tier of layers. So you can start out with Tent City, you can say, oh, you know what, we don't have a budget. We can't pay 100% tax. We're going to you know, buy a tent and that's where our base of operations is going to be. But there's pros and cons to that. I mean, there's people who are going to be like borrowing stuff from your tent and uh, you'll have neighbors that are coming and going. Then you can move into the city and the lowest tier is probably some sort of burnt out building. But the thing is, real estate is crazy expensive and crazy in demand inside the city. So if there's any kind of burnt out building that has not been insta rebuilt, there's probably a damn good reason why it hasn't been rebuilt. There's probably some fey hunting the fuck out of the building. So <laughs> you guys are going to be sharing the building with some fun neighbors. So much um, neighbors. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that, that's the lowest tier. And then you could, you know, rent a room at someone's house. And then you could rent an inn, uh, like a room in an inn. Or you could rent a house. Or you could buy a house. And each one of those comes with its pros and cons. And so like with an urban city, we, we come with a whole set of mechanics for what the, the players are going to have as their base of operations for the Ocean's Eleven team. You know, because you're going to have your quests in the city. Are you going to be running errands for the king? Are you going to be the part of the night watch? Are you going to be, you know, stalking, you know, the banks and stealing from them? You know, you make up your adventures in the city, but you're going to need a base of operations. And that's part of the box set as well. That's coming up in the box set, part of the book, part of everything else you're going to be getting. So, yeah, so... Our layer actions are not the monster does this because you're in its layer. Our layer actions are, well, you buy a tent here and you... <laughs> and if you hope you don't, you don't wake up with a slit in my throat. Yes. Well, and that's the thing. The tent city, tents are moving all the time. Yeah. And certain people do not want to pay night soil wagons, so they just dig a latrine pit. And then when they move their tent, they may or may not cover it over and fill it Because it's one good way to make sure that nobody really builds right on the site you just left right away because you didn't have time to dig up your, your little cauldron full of coins is to just leave the latrine pit open right beside it. And then people will avoid it for a few days until they can find some dirt or something to throw into it and then so that they can put their tent up there. So all of this stuff is going on all the time. And the king's soldiers usually don't patrol into the tent city because... They tend to disappear. Yeah. <laughs> A, they tend to disappear. Or, they, or if the citizens are feeling really nice, they just tend to disappear into a cloud of pearl dung and garbage. Yeah. You, know, it's just, you know, so uh, that, that's also, if you can get out the gates, you probably don't have to worry about immediate law enforcement. That's it. Law enforcement inside, you go to the law keeping sidebar, which is deep in the book, and it tells you exactly what a patrol looks like, or a, a stereotypical patrol. And we will cover in later things when somebody ups or doubles a patrol and why. And the horn calls they all use, and the code of horn calls for calling each other in case you do something bad to a soldier. And I've been portraying the soldiers here and earlier as. <laughs> Venal, venal humans, you know. I just want to get to the Empress Patrol. They want. They want to go check the ale to make sure it yeah. went, didn't go bad. Yeah, in this particular <laughs> tavern, you know. Um, and it's it's the old thing that real world managers do all the time when they have like forty locations they have to inspect. The location that's closest to their cottage or vacation home is where they end up at afternoon on a Friday. It's the last place they inspect. And then they just call head off and say, yeah, I'm going off duty now. And they get in the car and drive like, <laughs> okay, same thing. The, these soldiers are as human as the rest of us. And they do cut corners. Um, they usually don't want to accept bribes because you never know when a shadow hand is watching. But there are 
bribes and then there are bribes. And those are the kings, the shadow hands. So yeah. Let's explain the shadow hands. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. The, the king's secret <coughs> hands. Yeah. Those bastards. <laughs> <laughs> um, th there's a... Hmm. I was going to say there, there would be a fair turnover amongst the shadow hands if various people in the city didn't think I am taking on a cabal of murderers who will never stop. Who are they? Like Citrix Gestapo? Like what's mm -hmm. the easiest way to work this? Yeah, they're, they're, his, they're his dirty trick secret agents who yeah. oper operate outside the law. He does have arms of courtiers, like he has his soldiers. He has arms of courtiers of like the tax collectors, mm -hmm. you know, whom everybody knows and they need bodyguards and those come from the king's soldiers. He has some of his official investigators who tend to be pompous little asses with, you know, lots of scrolls and stuff and, and a big bodyguard so that they can, so they can investigate. And let's see what the problem is yet. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, the shadow hands are the guys that the investigator goes away and you think you fooled him because he was acting like a pompous ass and he overlooked something. And that night, the thing that he noticed, but said nothing about, is it's not my job. It's the investigator's yeah. investigator. Yeah. <laughs> so the shadow hands will arrive in the middle of the night, creep down from the edge of your roof, hang by their toes, looking through your window upside down, mm -hmm. and seeing what you're doing. And if you happen to be writing something interesting, or you happen to be peeling back some boards on your wall and they discover that your way of hiding all your gold rods because everybody talks about scat as the um, this is not who this is yeah, S -K -A -T. The, that's kind of the the slang for the silver pieces yeah. or yeah, yeah your 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 currency yeah and it is used yeah as as an american slang guy would say mulax or yeah yeah okay but the king introduced gold rods as a, above that gold, which can be snapped off in sections mm -hmm. to pay for something. But the sh if you let the shadow hand who's hanging outside the window upside down by his toes see that your way of hiding your gold rods is to melt them all down in your hearth fire and wallpaper the wall with molten gold and then put the boards back up. Uh, yeah. Paint it, paint it black, yeah. so people will go, hey, gold, <laughs> and then, then put boards over it. Um, you may receive a visit. From and it building may, inspector. Yeah, <laughs> or it may be a visit when you're out working. And you come home and all of your walls have been taken down. My gold. All my gold. And then you receive a tax bill from the palace mm -hmm. for the same amount of gold they took. Because, hey, king's tax is 100%. Yep. You obviously weren't declaring that. Yeah. So, <laughs> and where do I get the money from? Welcome to a life of crime or run like hell. Exactly. <laughs> and, and to rewind to your, the guards have a life and they have a family and they have, you know, they're regular people. One of the things that I ended up doing, because we're running this in my weekly campaign uh, with my players, one of the fun things I had to do was have my players, well, you know, you know, the typical RPG MO, which is like, oh yeah, the guards are giving me a hard time. Yeah, initiative. Let, let's go kill the guards. So they kill the guards. And then I'm like, okay, so the following day, in front of the building that you guys, this is your lair, there's a funeral procession. And so now, you know, Ed, the guy that you ended up killing, well, his two sons, you know, he was a single dad, and so they're they're walking by the corpse. They're they're carrying his their father's corpse, and so now you've got the widow as well of the other, and they just realize the, the, the players are just like, what the hell, Andrew? What are you doing to us? <laughs> like, yeah, they're real people. They're they're, they're not they're just your like no name like <laughs> red shirts. Yeah, like you are in a city. There is a, there is a sociology in the city. You kill people there, they have families, they have a life, they they know people. And all of a sudden it just hit my players. They were like, oh shit, this is an urban campaign. Yeah, oh you son of a bitch. You're making us feel guilty. Ah, oh, fuck. Okay, we're going to go see the orphans. Oh, I'm going to pay out. Oh man, we're going to take them in. And the guards oh, you killed. Yeah. And it was just like, all of a sudden they were like, they felt guilty about everyone they killed in that, like, that group of eight guards. 
They're like, okay, we're gonna pay the widows, we're gonna go take in the orphans. Oh shit, you're such a bastard. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it just changed yeah, everything yeah. the way they were looking at the city. And all the guards <laughs> they killed were no longer there. Yeah. Which meant suddenly, whenever they left, their servants, spouses, children were receiving visitations at the door. Nice little hovel you've got here. <laughs> if something happened to me. You know, because that didn't happen before, because the guards lived there. Yeah. And you know, it was like, oh yeah, we're not doing that neighborhood. But now we know the guards are gone. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> so it's, it's a really interesting dynamic that takes you out of those fantasy tropes that you normally get into. It's just kick open the door, kill the goblins that have no name, loot their corpses. All of a sudden, you've just flipped the entire game for your players of like, Oh, crap. Okay, we have to weigh all our decisions in terms of drawing a sword and killing something. Mm -hmm. Because now our freaking GM is going to make us feel fucking guilty. And, and <laughs> to spin that out one little bit, the last adventure we will run here at GaryCon is entitled, This Cabal Collects Heads. <laughs> Say no more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and that's the one thing we so far haven't detailed, but it will go in a later book, is all about the cabals. But we have put them in the Patreon, or some of them, um, because, you know, um, we have to write them each month. Feed the beast. Yeah. Uh, so there, there are things we haven't gotten around to yet, because if I spend every month feeding the beast, those don't get written. <laughs> Shall we open up the Q&A? Yes, yeah. Um, mindful of the fact that it is now 5 o'clock, some of you may have to run to other events that start on the hour. We, we gabbed, because, hey, we're game designers, we can gab for hours. We I'm gabbed until the, <laughs> yeah, until the top of the hour so that we could then go Q&A at this point. Very quickly, if you guys could just talk about where you, that book is available. We have some people asking online as well. Um, so right now it is at our booth at the show. So this is a special delivery just for GaryCon. It will be released next month, um, a global release. And this is part of the Viking Ultimate Viking Anthology Kickstarter. So our 13th Kickstarter that we released. Uh, it will be fulfilling as part of a full box set of Athkliath. So this is one of five books that are going to be in the box set. Uh, so we're going to be releasing everything individually. Uh, so there's a rule book, uh, there's a dweller creation, there's a missions book, there's a overview book, and there's a deep dive book uh, along with maps and pre-gens and all kinds of other things in that box set. Uh, which you get at a steal, basically. If and you buy them all at once. Exactly. And, and then this is going to be, all these books are going to be available individually as well. The overview book, uh, what, we're talking a month before it's everywhere? Everywhere! Everywhere. Don't eat month. that month, just buy this. Yeah. Um, and then the, the um, deep dive book. Like Drive Through RPG and, and uh, Fate of Yeah. Um, the the deep dive, which is, will be called River Fleet, because that's the district of the city we're doing the deep dive on, will be about as big as that. Some of those other books will be more slender, yeah. because they can be. Um, but yeah, like everything else, if you buy them all as a box set, it costs a lot less than if you buy the individual ones. Um, producing books is expensive these days, <laughs> the actual, when they get to be that size. It's not like go to your local printer and say, hey, um, can you give me some eight and a half by eleven sheets of paper, fold them in half, put a staple through it? You know, no, no, these are like whoa, three hundred and sixty odd pages. Um, yep. But yeah, um, that's where they they're they're imminently available. How's that? Um, if you can shake down a Viking on the way back from a raid, you may be able to get a copy early. If not, if you if you if you just want to do the dull, boring, lawful root of uh, connecting with establishment and parting with money, uh, it may take a little longer for <laughs> they're widely available. Yeah, so this spring, this summer, the box set will be out. Yeah. 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 Questions from the audience? Go ahead. Are you guys actual wizards? Um, <laughs> because... Between the sheets. No. <laughs> 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 
the amount of detail and because I I bought the book earlier. The amount of detail that I'm seeing in there is spectacular. How long did this take you? Two and a half years of us talking on the regular and designing and querying each other and picking each other's brains and just just an incredible amount of passion from both of us. Like we'd call each other it was just excited, excitement in our voices of like, oh I thought of this and I thought of that and Oh, how about this? And how about th how would this be? And, and yeah, it's just it, two and a half years of that. You just got to put the time in and do the work, and then at the back of your mind say, "Oh, but I can't, I can't cut that corner." Yeah. Um, the readers, the gamers deserve full coverage. I can't stint that. And then whenever you thought of something, oh, I have to. I have to figure out where the seagulls go to die. Okay. Yeah. I can't. I can't cut the corner. It's got to be in there, or at least I have to think it through because it's all got to be part of the tapestry. That's one of the things you'll see if you go down to the Pendlehaven booth. Is there's a lot of love in the books. Uh, yeah. You're going to see art budgets that they're going to just drop your jaw. Some of these are like you're like, how do they even pay the authors because mm -hmm. the the art is wall to wall on some of the books. This guy, long before I came along, published. The Edda, the real world epic Edda. And he went through all of the different surviving texts. And it's like an annotation where he goes through I made this decision for this line because of this. I compared this with this, and I went this way. He showed his work. It's like they say in school show your work. You know, he did, because you do. If you care that much, you don't want to just put it out there and have some guy say, oh, this guy just pulled the Edda out of his ass. No. I did the research. It was three and a half years of my life. Yeah. Everyone on my team was joking. My wife was sliding food under the door and keeping the door locked until it was done. <laughs> yeah, it was yeah. two years of translating Old Norse to English and then another year and a half of rewriting the English into something that flows and is a, something, a pleasure to read. I've read, the, uh, I've read some of the other books. I've enjoyed radio instructions more than those books. Because it's got to be readable. Yeah. It and is. it's got to spark ideas, yeah. not just be this gobbledygook, get to the end of it and say, so what does that say again? No, it's got to be a pleasant read. I, I remember I was reading one book, and it took me three reads to digest it. And I finally digested it, and I sat there and I went, oh, for a land rock? <laughs> because that's what basically it was about, was whose side of the fence was supposed to be where. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and the teacher's like, yeah, we're going to rock, I'm over here like this. I will never have that time back. Yeah, yeah it, was, it, it was basically, it was like, I just spent yes. yeah. seven hours reading about where the Freaking property lines. Yeah. Well, and that's the other thing. If you don't want to waste time, but you are willing to trust us, when you read our names and their variant spellings, and you will notice that there is one and only one person in the book who is an O apostrophe mm -hmm. last name, yeah. an Irish name. Uh, the Lady Lacora O'Hart, mm -hmm. because she's the wealthiest noble, and she's at the forefront of name changes. All the other O oh, whatevers have no no apostrophe. That's not because we're idiots. It's because we did our research. All the old Norse names were authentic for the period because they shifted. You know, we're such geeks. Yeah, we have done <laughs> the research. <laughs> such so, if, if you have a prof, that's all it is. Yeah, yeah. If, if you have some prof in a, in a high muck and muck university, looks at it and goes, "Oh, they didn't do their research." Yes, we did. Yes. <laughs> better than you. <laughs> some of the conversations I look back on. Like, yeah, you're so pedantic on some of this stuff. And and we had to tell our editor because our editor would flag things. There's yeah, no the editor here, would be like, but there's no apostrophe over here. No. Oh no, we need to get on a call thing. with him yeah. and explain this. Yeah. So Jeez. we want everything to be correct, so you don't have to waste your time on that. So I think you hinted at it earlier, talking about you know this person owns these properties. In the book, are you drawing some, some of the lines for relationships between some of the NPCs? You know, this person owes money to this one, or oh, yes, this Ooh. lady yeah. can't stand her neighbor for. Okay. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, yeah. The, the relationships are a huge part of the network 
of social combat within the city because there are cabals, there are levers of power in terms of who controls what, in terms of economy, politics, military. And so you want to ally yourself with certain people, but if you do, it's not a win-win, it's a win-lose. So you're going to be allied with somebody, but you're going to lose out because they're enemies with somebody else. Somebody else is going to make you their enemy as well. Or just discount you as somebody to trade with. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you trade with them. We're not touching you. Yeah. Now, and there are cabals and cabals. So we've been talking about the sort of murderous cabals or almost religious cults or cabals that have a political, strong political aim, like, you know, killing and replacing the king, you know. Uh, but there are also cabals that it just means these three merchants get together and say, you know, we can undercut um, Hulker over there if we buy in bulk together. So there's those sort of cabals that are quite innocent. They're just a little behind the scenes action. And they may or may not be doing anything illegal. That may be perfectly legal what they're doing. But it's cabal in that they trust each other enough to meet in secret in somebody's upper room, hoist a few drinks and say, so this week, we can make a profit. Yeah, if, if you buy up that, that mule there, um, I can tell you this guy's mule's on its last legs. And if I slip at something, He's going to need to buy a new mule, and he'll have nowhere to buy them except for you, you, and me. Mm -hmm. And we'll, we've already agreed what our price will be, just five scat higher than we was last week. You know, that sort of thing. And, and there's lots of that little stuff. And we hint at it more than we spell it out because we just ran out of word count. But you can see it there in the pages. So you can, ah, got it. And you can use it if you want it and not use it if you don't. Because exactly. some people will want their their city to be a little happier and brighter than we painted it, um, <laughs> metaphorically, not because there's no sun. Well, there are happy mean, places yeah, in here too. Yeah, yeah. But what we mean is, you don't have to have every single person be a schmuck on the take, or or looking where they can stick the dagger in. You can have nice people in the city. There are followers of the white god in the city who are really nice. And they are considered really insane. And we challenge you to find the monastery in the city that Citric has not condemned. Yes, because he hasn't found it yet. Yes. <laughs> but we find it for you. <laughs> because that's the sort of caring we are. <laughs> Next question. Let's not all be see the same hands. <laughs> Are you going to have another run of the cloth maps every time? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So we're, we're playing around with different sizes and different uh, fonts and colorations. So we're trying to get to the, the winning formula for the box set. So you see one at our booth that's like draped on the back of the booth, which is monstrous in size. Uh, we've got this one. Uh, I'm working with another one uh, in the process of trying to find the one that's going to be in the box set. So, yeah. uh, because this, I think, is too small to be yeah. easily readable. Exactly. It gives you a great helicopter view of flying over the city, Yeah. but it's harder to read when you're going... We're, we're kind of perfectionist yeah. when it comes to this. So, like, my quote is, like, the old Blizzard uh, software company, which is, it's ready when it's ready. So, um, we're going to keep iterating until, like, I'm really happy with all of the components and everything that goes into it. And it's the same thing with the map. So we've got several tapestries that are going together, and I'm talking to different manufacturers in terms of you know all, everything that's going to go into it. But like when that box set pops open, like I want to just be like all like tingly when when I open it up. Yeah, so, mm -hmm. yeah, that's the goal. It, it it's like the goal for the D and D movie. You don't just want to put something out to be in the cinemas this week. Yeah. You want to produce something you can be proud of. And 15 or 20 years down the road, people won't have totally forgotten it. They'll, they'll go, oh, oh yeah, I remember that. You know, you need to be to achieve that at least that level. And yeah. if we're going to spend all this time and effort on it, we want to be proud of it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I don't have a hard date. I have a hard quality setting for what we're going to put out. Yeah. 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 Which, you know, Certain gaming companies should always have at all times because you're paying money for their products. Um, there are certain types of products that could be small little fun stuff. 
Like, if you are doing, say, a cloisonné pin for a fictitious organization, you come up with a design which is presumably already in the lore, and then you just make it to be the size and heft that you want it to be. You're still making a design decision, but it is essentially a small, simple thing. But if it's something that has lore within it, then and the depth and coverage and the clarity of the coverage, and, you know... Um, there, and there are ways that you go around things, like, for instance, as I was saying earlier, all these people who have by names and so on. And both the Celts and the Norse have by names, no surnames. But they follow a pattern. So if you want to put it in a more fantasy medieval setting, you may want alternative names. So that, you know, it is not Elifer Magnuson, because that's the way the name went. It could be, you know, you want him to be Elwan Moonwood or something like that, because that sounds more like, okay, if we're going to provide lists of alternative names, we might stick that on the website, mm -hmm. you know, rather than making you pay for something like that. But we would still try and provide it when we can get around to it, but it's lower priority than getting the next book out. But we want it to be covered because we don't want to leave you in the lurch if you bought the other book and then say, oh yeah, they don't care. No, we care. We want you to know we care. No. So we look good, but so that you're served at the gaming table. It's that simple. It's like it's like make your game um, more fun for you to run, less prep time, because then we feel good that we helped your lives. You know, it, because you know, frankly, if we just wanted to make millions of dollars, there are better ways. We're in the wrong industry. Yeah, we're in the wrong industry. Yeah, 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 yeah. We should play the stock market and, and start false rumors all the time yeah, exactly. insider trade. You know. Any other questions? Well, thank you very much, yeah. everyone, for coming out. It was a pleasure to share this with you. Yeah. Welcome to Ask Me Out. Exactly. And, and hopefully, next Gary Con, when we do a seminar, the box set will be out and it'll be here's the new stuff. Yeah. And then there will be more. We will follow the process of holding a seminar like that to ask you what you want next. What do you want most? So we can bring it to you. Because it's not about what we can think up and ram down your throats. It's about what you need the most for when you're using this at your gaming table. Okay, what do you need first? What do you need more? What do you need most? Okay, we'll do that. And that's what we ask on the Patreon every single month. Yeah. So that's one of my questions every single time. We have four tiers. We released uh, a, um, a PDF for every single one of the tiers, and every single one of them, I ask, how do you guys like it? What do you guys want to see next month? What works? What doesn't work? What do you want to see more of? And the patrons kind of direct where we're going to go with the next content. So you guys sign up. You guys direct where the city goes next. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because for me, I'm at that difficult decision thing because I know how long it's taken me to do the deep dive for the, just this bit of the city. Mm -hmm. Do I then immerse myself for another year to do the next part of the city as a deep dive? Or do we need to give you something else first? Yeah, you guys want sagas? Do yeah. you want a North Shore? Do you want to have monsters that are in the city? Like, you tell us. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, what works for your table? I'm thinking, okay, some people will want sagas, mini-adventures, yeah. set in the city that don't necessarily lead you outside the city until we're ready to give you the outside the city so we don't leave you hanging you mm -hmm. know you're riding you're riding <laughs> off the edge of the map keep riding you know <laughs> you fall then you <laughs> die <laughs> make a new character yeah yeah <laughs> you see the turtles open their mouth <laughs> <laughs> yeah roll up another character now yeah exactly. yeah but yeah we're always at the decision point okay what do we do next do we do this or we do this yeah. why don't we ask the gamers exactly why don't we ask the people who already love and use this what would be most useful for us to do next yeah. because it is a service industry you tell us what's next I don't know. Oh, <laughs> read faster. I had to write it faster. No. <laughs> and, uh, actually, uh, as you talked about that, I was funny about that from the beginning of this. The first book I read was the ADD second edition book. I read that when I was in something great. That was the first book I read when I went to the flying up the results of the great. And I'm definitely one of those people that 
I saw the cool thing. I need to learn how to read that. And then, like, actually, you know, you know, being dyslexic and everything. And by far, I've done everything that a dyslexic person is not supposed to do. Nice. By reading? Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. you and wanted so, to. It's always, it's always entertaining when I sit there and look at, like, the people who know, I don't know who these people are, and go, yeah, you know, your expectations now what? Yeah. You know. Yeah. But yeah, I actually have a question. Who's on that book? Yeah. Because sure. I have stuff from you for like five years, and the only thing that's been signed is stuff my, my wife gets signed. I have a Sharpie. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's here for a reason. And I'd like to get something yeah. done by then. Sure. Uh, yeah. I, I, I too brought signing implements, oh, shovels and rakes and implements of this truck. Well, thank you everyone for coming. Yeah, thank you. We appreciate it. Yeah.